All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second session this term of the Cambridge Sociology Seminar Series. Um, it's nice to see lots of familiar faces as well as new faces joining in. Um, this is, as you can see, happening on Zoom because of current circumstances, but we are actually quite pleased about it happening on Zoom because it means that a wider range of people can join us. It's more accessible. It's also being live streamed on YouTube where you can participate in a conversation um, and it will be recorded and made available online via the department website and social media. So just lots of places to join us, follow us, take part in the conversation. Um, all thanks to Joe, who's been managing communications for sociology um, in, in this time um, and does generally as well. Right, so I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Alia Hamidrao. Um, Alia is an assistant professor in qualitative research methodology at the London School of Economics. And I have been very interestedly and gladly following her research for the last couple of years because her research interests also overlap with mine and because her work is just really interesting. Um, so she broadly works in the area of work, family and gender, but she's much more specifically, and I think this makes her work really relevant for this particular moment as well. She is particularly interested in economic uncertainty and how this interacts with different gendered patterns, both at the sites of work and family. I'm also very excited to share with you that her book is just hot off the press. Her book is called Crunch Time. Um, in, in the book, she looks at how unemployment is experienced quite differently, starkly differently by men and women in the US. Um, and I know that Alia has also been recently thinking and writing about how the coronavirus pandemic means that there are these shifts in work and life patterns which can potentially mean that we may set back gender equality um, by a significant amount of time. So there's a lot to think about um, and I won't delay any more. I'll just hand over to Alia. Alia will speak for about 40, 45 minutes um, and then we'll have a chance for questions and we can do this both through chat and through using the hand raise feature, um, but we'll come to that after Alia's talk. So straight over to you Alia. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thanks, Astia. Thanks for having me here today. I'm so excited to share my research. So I'm just going to go into the share screen and um, share my PowerPoint right now. Uh, there we are. Okay, so my um, talk today, I'll share a major argument from my book, which, as you mentioned, came out in June of this year. And the book examines unemployment and job searching experiences in the US. So as you can see on the slide, these are news articles from the US, from the UK, and from Australia about sort of um, rising job loss, um, unemployment claims, and things like that. And what this is really speaking to is that since March and the off onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, a key concern of individuals, families, nations, and policymakers has been with the economic implications of lockdown measures imposed by COVID-19. The news has been inundated with headlines of the following kinds, like you see on the screen here. Um, it's pointing to unparalleled unemployment claims, soaring unemployment, and buckling businesses. Companies that have declared bankruptcy during the pandemic include department stores, um, for instance, in the U.S., like Lord & Taylor and Neiman Marcus, airlines like Virgin Atlantic and Cathay Dragon, um, Hertz Rental Car, J. Crew Clothing Store, and so on. The pandemic has wrought devastating losses of people and of livelihood. So job loss is especially acute in the pandemic, but it's actually become part and parcel of many economies, including the US. Job loss impacts financial, emotional, and other aspects of our well-being, but it also has implications for gender inequality. In the central argument of my book, uh, Crunch Time, How Married Couples Confront Unemployment, I focus on how men's and women's unemployment reproduces gender inequalities when it comes to paid and unpaid work. My research for this book, I think it behooves saying, was done pre-pandemic, but the findings that I'll present offer some sobering insights into how pervasive unemployment and it may exacerbate gender inequalities. So I'm going to start by sharing the experience of one unemployed man and one unemployed woman. Um, these examples should give you a taste of what the overall findings will be. Darlene Buck and all names that I use here or pseudonyms, lost her job as a high-ranking marketing executive four months ago. But she's surprisingly cheerful. She says that she feels like a superwoman because she's been able to, she says, do the things that I didn't have time to do before. 
like participate more in my teenage son's school things. I felt really happy about it because it's like, this is a taste of what it is to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, at about $150,000 a year, or about 116,000 uh, pounds a year of base salary, Darlene's income had been three times as much as her husband Larry's. But when I spoke with Larry about his wife's unemployment, he said he's perfectly happy to have her hang out and enjoy life. Now we'll see that Darlene's experience is very different from Todd Barron's. The Barron's are having a difficult time. Todd lost his marketing job five months ago. His wife, Kimmy, also works. But instead of feeling like a Superman, like Darlene did, Todd has been morose. His five foot nine inch frame stoops, his eyes dart around and he fidgets, constantly rubbing his middle finger against his thumb. Kimmy has been wor uh, worried about him, saying that she talked him out of doing something rash, ending his life or something. Todd's unemployment strikes both him and his family hard. Instead of enjoying time with his family, um, at home as Darlene does, Dot is focused on finding a job as quickly as possible. Kimmy too thinks this is crucial. Unlike Larry, who is relaxed about Darlene's job searching, Kimmy is exasperated with Dot. Rolling her eyes, Kimmy describes Dot as he's like a sit on your hands, let the other shoe drop kind of guy. Dot and Darlene are among millions of college educated Americans experiencing unemployment. And the US Bureau of Labor Statistics notes that approximately 90% of college educated workers can expect to experience at least one spell of unemployment. Most will experience more. Their higher levels of education and credentialing no longer protect these workers from unemployment as they did in decades past. But how is it that comparable men and women like Darlene and Todd, both college educated married professionals with children come to have such different experience of unemployment? And in this talk today, I'll show what goes on in marriages and at home to produce such divergent responses. Okay, so the last few decades have seen significant shifts in work and workplaces. Um, and US uh, organizations have actually often been uh, instrumental in normalizing organizational policies around planned layoffs and downsizing, which have really become a routine part of how business is done now. Um, my decision to collect this data in the US is motivated by the employment reality there where these employment shifts are, shifts are especially prominent. But actually, as we are seeing in the pandemic, these employment shifts are sort of um, visible in a lot of in a lot of countries, um, certainly here as well. Um, in seeking to cut costs for themselves, organizational leadership has passed on risks to workers by replacing standard, stable and secure work with non-standard work, like contract work, temp work and gig work. These are not limited to low wage workers and have become a key part of professional experience for high, high wage workers as well. Research in the sociology of work has told us a lot about how these shifts toward uncertain work impact workers. But a limitation in this research um, is that it continues to conceptualize workers as being impacted individually as the workers operate outside of other social institutions, especially the family. So, but the heterosexual married nuclear family and the workplace are actually deeply tied together. Men's and women's roles as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers, place them in varied relationships with employment. Employment has been central to dominant or hegemonic conceptions of masculinity in the US. And you can sort of see this here on this side. Um, there's, it's uh, sort of intertwined, masculinity is intertwined with the imperative uh, to provide for families. There are also alternative possibilities uh, of masculinity, for instance, sort of, you know, being embracing um, stay at home fatherhood and so on. But these are not at this point hegemonic. These are not dominant um, sort of ideals. Um, basically, to be a good dad or a good husband, a man is expected to still provide economically, usually through a job. In contrast, employment has been framed as butting heads with motherhood. Um, dominant conceptions of motherhood, even though these are also changing, continue to frame women's employment as sort of an obstacle to ideal mothering in the US. Um, this is sort of exacerbated by the lack of social policy provision, which, was, which would sort of facilitate um, caregiving, managing caregiving and uh, paid work at the same time. So scholars have previously highlighted this interdependence between the nuclear family and the world of work. A paid work, I should say rather. This is most evident in the concept of the ideal worker, which has been influential in sociological, legal, and management research. 
This concept explains that organizations expect workers to work long hours into the evenings, uh, weekends, travel for work, and generally prioritize work over everything else. The reward for this is um, predictable progress within one company for life and an ideal worker wage, um, which is an income that's sufficient to comfortably sustain a nuclear family. As feminist scholars have pointed out though, this ideal ignores that this uh, dedication to work is only possible when there's someone whose primary or even sole job is to care for the family, the wife, the mother, or as is seen in this research, in this literature, the marginalized caregiver. But what happens to this kind of organization of family, which both supports and depends on this notion of a stable career trajectory in an era where employment, even for these privileged workers, is rife with uncertainty. And the assumptions undergirding the ideal worker norm of a career ladder, of employer-employee loyalty, are really no longer the reality. How do families, um, especially um, married couples, respond to these changes in work? So some scholars think that uncertainty will pave the way for more gender equality in marriage as both spouses income sort of becomes crucial for the household. Um, so as work becomes unreliable and uncertain, do married couples become more egalitarian? This has been one kind of key question. Or do families stubbornly dig their heels in and hold on to gendered ideals? These are theoretically important questions because they tell us how gender norms are reproduced and rationalized. So, um, but how much sort of people, especially married couples, are willing to let go of these powerful gendered ideals has typically been examined by sociologists of the family using both quantitative and qualitative methodology. Scholars have leveraged unemployment, usually men's, as a conceptually interesting time when issues of gender around paid and unpaid work become magnifi uh, sorry, magnified um, and transparently observable. Many, but not all of these studies of unemployment find evidence for quite gender inegalitarian outcomes. And I'll just tell you a few of these. Findings show that unemployed men do less housework than their employed wives. Wives increasing income helps to sort of buy them out of doing unpaid work, but this is up, uh, only up until they earn the same as their husbands. When wives start earning more than their husbands, and especially when they earn considerably more than their husbands, there's evidence that wives actually do more housework, right? So they're when they're earning a lot more than their husbands, there's evidence that wives are doing more housework. Now scholars suspect that this is because, um, this is explained by wives sort of performing a domestic femininity so that husbands don't feel emasculated, that basically by out earning husbands, wives are transgressing normative gender expectations. To, so to make up for that, they're doing more housework to sort of be like, this is my domain, um, this is my feminine domain, and you're, you know, that's your sort of masculine domain or whatever. And this is sort of actually where qualitative studies come in to understand the marital processes or the mechanisms that lead to these outcomes around paid and unpaid work. Findings from qualitative studies of unemployment and marriage have been pretty mixed on this regard though. Some qualitative studies have found that men's unemployment means more gender inequality, uh, sorry, more gender equality in the marriage as unemployed um, men embrace a modern masculinity that sort of embraces caregiving. These studies show that men do more chores, especially um, those related to childcare, that they see their masculinity as less vested in earning and providing, and couples highlight the importance of women's paid work. Others don't find this. That these empirical findings are mixed matters theoretically because this research has not illuminated mechanisms producing the unequal outcomes that quantitative data has found. This is a limitation and it requires studies that are designed to clearly get at these mechanisms. Um, let's, okay. So these disparate findings may be due to methodological choices scholars have made in prior research. And the first of these is that prior studies have tended to focus on men's unemployment. Empirically, this choice means that we know quite little about women's unemployment experiences and our theories of unemployment are really derived from men's experiences. But because masculinity and uh, femininity make specific and varied demands, which tend to hinge on men's and women's relationship to employment, this is a significant limitation. Second, decisions around whose paid work should be emphasized and why are usually made by spouses through interactions. Yet prior research has tended to collect data from the unemployed individual. And you don't get as rich um, a dynamic of couples interactions, sorry, 
of couples' interactions and marital processes by speaking to only one person in the couple. Linked to this, prior research typically has not offered observational data that gets at these interactional aspects, processes that are so crucial to um, understanding marriage, uh, marital and family life. And third, because unemployment is sensitive to time, it gets harder the, more, the longer it goes on. Collecting interview data at multiple points in time is crucial to get a sense of how the experience of unemployment evolves over time. And this has not necessarily always been captured by sort of um, qualitative studies in particular, this overtimeness issue. So these are methodological limitations with theoretical implications. My study uses interview with unemployed professionals, their spouses, follow-up interviews, and family observations to, in order to illuminate everyday processes um, in marriage during a time of unemployment. So this is my methodological contribution. My theoretical contribution is to connect job searching, which is an important substantive area of research in the social sciences and within sociology, for instance, in economic sociology and sociology of work, with sociology of the family to clearly show how gender inequalities are maintained at a moment that is quite ripe for dismantling them. So this brings me to my research question, which is how do families organize themselves when it comes to paid and unpaid work during a spouse's unemployment? This question is important because it's about the logics underlying the reproduction of unequal gendered beliefs and behaviors at a time, unemployment, um, that is opportune for more gender egalitarian marital practices. Um, I recruited participants for this study from the Northeast of the US and you can, that's the sort of red bit, um, sorry, that's the red bit over there. Um, and I designed the study to privilege theoretical saturation and the collection of qualitatively rich data to understand interactions and processes. So a little bit about the research design. My inclusion criteria required participants to be heterosexual, um, married, dual earner, college educated with dependent children, where one partner is unemployed. Participants, so given this criteria, participants are from the professional middle class and come from a range of occupations such as lawyers, chemists, teachers, and marketing and managing professional, uh, management professionals, sorry. Dual earner families are also necessary to make a tenable comparison of gendered unemployment experiences. Um, also empirically, um, unemployment experience of this social class have received limited qualitative attention and closing this gap of what does sort of unemployment look within a relatively privileged group was one of my empirical goals. Um, interviews lasted about two hours with each person and I conducted conducted these um, virtual interviews in a place that participants chose. This was usually a cafe. Sometimes it was my office or a space on my campus. And sometimes it was their home. I contacted participants for follow-up interviews between six months to a year after the original interview. And the follow-up interviews lasted about an hour. I conducted family observations with four families, two of unemployed men and two of unemployed women. And what I did when I collected this data was I visited each family for about two to three weeks, usually going daily in that time period for, um, and I went for every, anywhere from two to eight hours for, for a visit. I would try to go during a time when the whole family would be there. Um, and this is because I'm trying to see interactions within, within family members. So it didn't make sense for me to go, for instance, in the morning when only the unemployed person would be at home. So this meant I was usually going um, afternoon, evening to like dinner time staying post dinner is usually what it meant. We, uh, weekends, I would go for pretty much for the whole day. Um, when I was observing families, I spent most of the time with them at their homes, but I also um, sometimes went out with them, for example, on trips to the zoo, to the library, to birthday parties, grocery shopping. I helped paint the house with one family and I went on a road trip across a US state with another family. And um, I would write up field notes from my observations within 24 hours of the visit. Field notes usually took me twice as long as the visit to write up. So what this means is if a visit was two hours long, it, I usually uh, spent four hours writing out fleshed out field notes. Um, observing their families, especially relatively affluent ones as the ones in my study were, despite being unemployed, um, and especially when they're experiencing a crisis, which many of them really saw unemployment as being, um, is quite unusual. And I'm happy to discuss family observations at length in the Q&A. For now, I'll just kind of move on from this though. 
So as you can see on the table, I conducted interviews with 25 unemployed men and 23 unemployed women, interviews with about, with about half their spouses, follow-up interviews with about half the total sample, and family observations with four families. Oh, this is a bit grainy, sorry about that. Um, I won't go over the demographic background in detail, but we can take a look at that later um, in more detail if you have questions. Uh, briefly, the median age of unemployed men was 49, of unemployed women, 47. Unemployed men's household income prior to unemployment had been um, a median of 150,000 US dollars um, or 115,000 pounds, and women's was 165,000 US dollars or 127,000 pounds. So these are in the top quartile of American households, and most are really in the top 10 to 15% of American households. Um, unemployed men had been in median terms, married for 17 years, women for 16 years. In terms of racial and ethnic variation, overall um, about 80% of the sample was white and 20% was non-white. The non-white included, included a mix, for example, native born black and Indian origin participants. So this is really an overwhelmingly white sample that's from the professional middle class. This is a sample that we would say is advantage in pretty much every dimension, economic, um, occupational, um, educational, and or racially advantaged as well. So their experience of unemployment is pretty informative in terms of how the privileged respond to unemployment, uh, to a sort of employment setbacks, specifically unemployment. Um, and did I mention this earlier? I don't know if I did, but at the time of the interview, men had been unemployed for about six months and women for about eight months. So just to give you a sense of um, their sort of social class status, this is a picture, this is not the picture of a house of anyone that I interviewed, but these are the kinds of houses that they often lived in and pretty affluent neighborhoods with very good, in very good school districts and so on. So they had comfortable homes, affluent lifestyles. Okay, this is a preview of the findings. Um, in the new economy characterized by labor market precarity, the devotion expected from an ideal worker, which I talked about earlier, who has a job is channeled into what I call an ideal job seeker. Someone who's devoted to finding a job in a context where job tenures are short and insecure and layoffs imminent. Um, and this is a table that's describing some ask, uh, characteristics of the ideal job seeker norm. So the ideal job seeker is someone who devotes considerable time to job searching, usually from home, networks extensively, works with career coaches or other kind of professionals, um, other kind of employment professionals rather. They reskill themselves and they sort of um, might work on obtaining professional credentials. For instance, one common thing would be getting certified for project man management um, of positions, for instance. This norm is shaped by the extensive changes in the world of work. What I'm doing is showing how compliance or non-compliance with this norm is not evenly distributed, but it's shaped by what happens at home. So you have a norm where basically finding a job is seen as a very important thing that you're meant to be doing, especially when you're unemployed. How people do it, whether people do it or not, whether they follow the sort of assumptions of this norm is really shaped by what happens at home. That's my argument. Um, especially amongst married couples. This norm seeps into private married lives of workers, shaping their interactions. Unemployed, and what I'm gonna argue is that unemployed husbands, but not wives, are expected to demonstrate compliance with, their, with this norm through interactions. And doing so becomes a way to legitimate the direction of resources, especially time, space, and money, to husbands to job search, but not to wives, but not to their unemployed wives to job search. Okay. So unemployed men and unemployed women in, this, in my study implicitly grasped this norm of the ideal job seeker. And it was actually often explicated through job search clubs, which are really ubiquitous in the US. Men and women agreed that job searching is time intensive and they repeated a version of searching for a job is a full-time job. Unemployed men and a participant in the study, James Peterson says, I just find the burden and rigors of search difficult. He refers here to the umpteen activities that are widely understood as necessary for successfully job searching. Darlene Bach, who we also met earlier, expands on these saying, you need to get into a solid rhythm to look for a job. You start planning out your day, get my binder together, my follow-up notes, figure out my networking, planning all my lunches and coffees with people. Participants see networking as important in job searching. 
Despite the shared understanding of what successful job searching looks like, unemployed men and women actually comply with this norm in very different ways. That's what I'll focus on today, this difference in compliance with this norm. Unemployed men expect themselves to adhere to this norm, and this is reinforced by their wives. This is not quite the case for unemployed women, as we'll see. So I'll preview the findings for unemployed men before sort of delving into them. In families with unemployed men, men's income is emphasized and job searching is consequently prioritized. There is a tremendous expectation that men will focus on job searching and demonstrate this intent focus to their wives. And men do so and wives help them by organizing men's time around their job searching, which also buys men out of um, the obligation to do sort of housework or other unpaid work. It also means that men receive space in the home dedicated to job searching, such as, for instance, the creation of a new home office or upgrading an already existing one. And now I'll just preview the findings for unemployed women. In contrast, in families of unemployed women, there is no such understanding that the loss of women's income is detrimental to household finances. And so there's consequently a minimal expectation that women should follow the ideal job seeker norm. While women in this study typically don't experience intense pressure to find a job quickly, this also means that they don't receive marital privileges that would allow them to focus on job searching. Women's days are not organized around job searching and the expectation that women have of themselves and that their husbands have as well is that women will take over most of the housework because they're unemployed and ostensibly have the time to do so. Um, and women also don't receive a space um, of their own to job search from. An especially intriguing aspect of these disparate approaches is that they're not economically rational. Unemployed men, regardless of what proportion of household income they provided, are sort of exhorted and expected to uh, focus on job searching. In families where women are unemployed, families are relaxed, even when women had been the primary earners, right? So these are not explained by how much money men and women had respectively brought into their homes. Right? So that's what I'm arguing. Okay, so now let's get into the findings. Um, couple, like I said, couples perceive men's unemployment and consequent decrease in household income as relative deprivation. The loss of material and cultural goods that otherwise accompany a social class status. So here's an example from the rat's eggs. Jim typically earned over $100,000 or about, um, at the time, about um, 77,000 pounds a year. But his annual income was unsteady as he dipped in and out of work. Most recently, he's been out of work for the past year. His Amelia, uh, his wife, sorry, his wife Amelia ha um, has had a steady job at the same company for the past two decades, earning usually twice what Jim did. Recently, Amelia has said that the lack of Jim's income is starting to impact their lifestyle. Um, but shaking his head and rolling his eyes in disbelief, Jim says, if you ask my wife if we've cut back on spending, she would say absolutely. And I say that's a farce because we still go on vacations. We're going to Mexico a week from Saturday. She thinks we've cut back on our lifestyle. Oh, that we don't travel as much, that we don't go out to eat as much. Jim really bristles at this idea that his current unemployment has meant relative deprivation for the family. Amelia, though, takes her interpretation of Jim's unemployment seriously, and she issued Jim an ultimatum. She says, I said to him, I don't care what you do, but you've got to do something by June 1st. Otherwise, you're going to work at McDonald's. You're getting out of the house. You need something now. For Jim, this ultimatum reinforced the idea that he was falling short of his responsibility to contribute to the family. Jim says, oh, that was hard to hear. Amelia's insistence on Jim's participation in paid work because they need his income does not really square with the material reality of their lives. For years, Amelia's income has been stable and really enabled their lifestyle. Emphasizing the importance of Jim's income is, is a sort of symbolic endeavor meant to help Jim comply with normative expectations of masculinity. But symbolism can be powerful. And by his follow-up interview with me, after Amelia's um, ultimatum deadline had passed, Jim and Amelia had invested upward of half a million dollars at the time, about 384,000 pounds, which included a significant portion of their savings to help Jim open his uh, own franchise of a window installation company. Um, Jim has had no experience working windows or with installation or anything. So this is like a complete departure from everything he's done before. So it's, this is a, a pretty big risk that they're doing. Um, and this demonstration, um, Sorry, this demonstrates a willingness by the Radziks to spend money um, by taking the risk of 
investing in this venture as they seek to comply with gendered expectations where Jim's particip participation paid work in employment is perceived to be necessary. I also just wanna point out, I was able to piece together different perspectives on the same issue, Jim's unemployment um, and family responses to it because of the different types of data that I collected. Um, interview with Jim, the unemployed man, interview with his wife, Amelia, uh, follow-up interviews with both of them individually, which sort of allowed me to see how decisions around the ultimatum actually kind of panned out. So on the other hand, couples with an unemployed woman emphasize that their families can manage well on their husband's income alone, and they don't highlight relative deprivation. Grace Bloom had worked in the public sector. In her, she's in her early 40s, and she's married to a lawyer who also works in the public sector, Finn. They have two elementary school-aged daughters. Before she lost her job, Grace and Finn had each brought in about 70,000 US dollars, or about 53,000 uh, pounds. At the time, they each brought in about the same annually, but neither emphasizes that Grace needs a job to enable the prior lifestyle. Grace says, we live very modestly. We always thought it important that we could keep our house on one income. She adds, if I could make like $12,000 a year, honestly, that would be enough to get us by. Finn concurs with this explanation saying in his own interview that we need a little bit more money, but not like a full-time income to make ends meet. Um, for example, Grace adds that her staying at home while unemployed actually saves them money. She says, the plus side of me being home is that we don't have to pay for summer camp, which would be two to $5,000 per kid. The Blooms don't especially feel very deflated about not being able to provide a summer camp experience to their children, which is actually a pretty common experience in their social class. Um, instead, they frame their needs as being pared down. In this context, complying with the ideal job seeker norm is less of a concern because the loss of a, the job and the loss of the income is seen as less of a con concern. So, like I said, men's unemployment is seen as a problem that must be rectified. And so men are afforded privileges at home to amend this by job searching to get reemployed. They must also demonstrate that they're focused on job searching, that they're being ideal job seekers. John Huber, who lost his job in the pharmaceutical industry three months ago, says, my contribution is I'm just trying to gainfully get work. So that's my role is to demonstrate that I want to work and that I'm doing everything possible to get work. And John demonstrates this by informing his wife of the jobs he applied to, networking meetings he scheduled, and the professional skill building he did. Here's another example from the Clarks, where Terry has been unemployed for six months. Terry's wife, Sandy, a paralegal, explains that she and Terry have established a routine of discussing his job search um, progress each day when she's driving home from work, she describes. So this is what Sandy says. It's kind of like taming the little creature in the little prince. You meet at the same time every day and you expect it to be there. I don't know that I've tamed him or whatever, and she chuckles, but the call is something I look forward to because I like to hear what he has to say. It's an important call for me. Wives respond to their husband's unemployment by em emphasizing the imperative for men to participate in this paid work, for instance, by having this call, by Amelia issuing that ultimatum that we sh saw she did. Now I'll show what this uh, looks like, this kind of emphasis on men's reemployment, men's job searching. It's really like a family concern, family issue. Um, I'll share what this looks like by telling you about the Jansen family whom I observed when Robert had been unemployed for about seven months. Robert and his wife, Laura, are both in the communications field and they bring in about half the household income each, um, which is, and each of them earn comfortably in the six figures. They have two children, a four-year-old daughter, Tessa, and two-year-old son, Taylor. Robert and Laura, like other couples in the study, focus on Robert's job search, with Laura often driving these discussions. So this is an excerpt from a field note I took. Um, at six this evening, Robert and Laura were setting the dinner table and preparing dinner. They maintained a friendly conversation. Laura started off by saying, so how was your day? Before Robert could answer, she energetically added, did you read the list of jobs I sent you? In a softer, tired voice, Robert said, I actually only skimmed it at the end of the day, so I don't have a chance to look in detail. Laura checks out job boards and emails Robert job lists um, of jobs that he, she thinks he, he'll be um, sort of qualified for. And wives of unemployed men in general reported reading cover letters and resumes and helping with interview preparations. So Laura, um, as my field notes continue, Laura resolutely pursued the above conversation. And I note in my field notes, as soon as the two kids and Laura and Robert were seated at the dinner table, 
Laura turned toward Robert and said, well, I looked it over and there were three jobs that would be great for you. Communications pro, Robert interrupted her saying, communications pro, like in the Midwest. Uh, remember they live in the Northeast, so that would entail a move. Laura shook her head and said, no, it's in the Northeast. Robert shrugged his shoulders and went to get a glass of water that he had left in the kitchen. Now, Robert appears disengaged from this conversation. You know, he responds desultorily. He enters and exits the room. It's, and, but it's really Laura's persistence which underlines the importance that she places in Robert's job search efforts. In my observations, I saw that Robert was a far more reluctant participant in this conversation than most men in the study, like John Huber or Terry Clark had claimed, and as we saw earlier. But Robert was also unusual, um, and he described Laura as sort of being very sort of harsh about his job search, being more involved than he would have liked her to be, which the other unemployed men didn't say. Um, Laura, like other wives in the study, has an expectation that Robert will sort of tell her about his job searching activities, and Robert is sort of not too enthused by that. Um, the adherence to the ideal job seeker norm is demonstrated at home to the spouse and becomes a way of legitimating resources, especially time and space, directed toward helping the unemployed man job search. Now let's move on to the women. So demonstrating such an adherence to their husbands is not expected of unemployed women. Darlene Bach, who we met at the start of the talk and after that as well, um, shrugs her shoulders and says, sometimes I'll talk to Larry. Um, when I asked her about, you know, who she talks to about her job search and so on. The Bachs were one of the families I observed and I repeatedly record the lack of discussion around Darlene's job search. And this is an excerpt from my field notes. Darlene and Larry discuss Larry's day in detail. He elaborates on the lunch options he had today and what he decided to eventually eat. He goes to a phone conversation he had with his brother-in-law. He tells Darlene that his sister who's moving needs his help. They discuss whether Darlene should make a casserole to take for his other sister who has been ill. But Larry doesn't inquire about Darlene's job searching activities. Although Darlene had a job interview um, this morning and also met with a recruiter, she and Larry did not discuss this. I have not seen them have detailed discussions about her job search. So husbands, uh, what I saw in, through my observation and through the interviews were often uh, distanced from wives' job search efforts. Um, and I knew this through my interviews, but it was really through the observations, through the family observations, that I understood the depth of how this played out interactionally, how they'll sort of hover around, they'll talk about everything, but not necessarily about her job search or her meeting with a recruitment um, professional. So the ideal job seeker norm demands complete time commitment to job searching. Encouraged by their wives, men structure their days to maximize their job searching. Uh, Terry Clark, who we met earlier, for instance, um, describes job searching as shaping his days. And he says, it's fairly structured. It's important to mitigate the risk of wasting time. I spent at least Monday through Thursday searching several websites using predefined searches that I have. Wives of unemployed men expect their husbands to approximate Terry's sort of laser focused commitment where job searching itself, as people said earlier, becomes like a job. Couples protect men's time from housework and for job searching activities. This urgency to find a job means that men don't especially position themselves as available for housework. For instance, when I asked Terry about the division of housework in his family now, he said, shrugs it off saying, I'm home to find a job, I'm not home to do that. The most acute example of this is childcare. 10 of the 25 men in the study had at least one child who was not yet kindergarten aged. Out of these 10, once men lost their jobs, only three families made extensive changes to childcare arrangements which directly relied on unemployed men. In the remaining seven families, men often took on more um, childcare responsibilities than they had before. For example, more pickups and drop-offs for uh, kids you know, from extracurricular activities, from school, from friends' houses and so on, but they didn't become primarily responsible. Now, I also just wanna point out that this matters because um, these were people, as you can see, you know, I mentioned earlier that unemployed men had been unemployed on average uh, uh, for six months at the time of first interview, that's long-term unemployment. So this is a significant amount of time where they're not, where patterns are not shifting, even though men have been unemployed for you know a long time. Just wanted to um, make sure that you got that. Um, again, let's see what happens with women. But couples with unemployed wives don't organize women's time to prioritize job searching. Eileen Boyle, who lost her job 27 years um, after 27 years with one company, says, 
Now I get up, take the kids to school because neither of them like the bus in the morning. And that's just something we fell into doing. I pick my daughter up from school. If she's working, I get her to work. Depending on what shift she's working, there are times I'll just bring my laptop and hang out in the cafe and do job searches, send out resumes, applications, that sort of thing. Um, Eileen's daughter is 16 years old and works um, an after school job at a cafe, which is pretty common um, in families of the social class in the US. Um, also, I just want to point out Eileen had been the primary earner in her family, making $100,000 a year in comparison to her husband's $30,000 a year. He earns about a third of what she does. So her job clearly matters to her family, yet her job search is fragmented. So unemployed women's time, whether they were the primary earners in their family or not, is not perceived as needed, needing to be protected from housework. Instead, husbands often make it clear that unemployed wives should take over housework. Cheryl Stanley, who lost her job a year ago and earned similarly to her husband, is sort of resentful when she describes how she's been in, inadvertently pushed into the role of, in her terms, Hannah Homemaker. So Cheryl says, my husband would take more turn doing things. He would help with the dinner, meals, or cleaning. Now that I'm not working, it's not even the realm of even anything he's thinking about. He doesn't think about, well, maybe he could help uh, clean the bathrooms, or he could run the vacuum, or he could do some shopping. Women's unemployment marks a focal point where husbands expect that all housework is um, women's responsibility. And women also feel that obligation that because they're not earning and contributing to the household by earning, they should contribute by taking over the housework, which is not how men felt. Um, I wanna take a moment to discuss a negative case, an exception to the dominant findings that I present on women in the study. So as you may know, in qualitative research, negative cases are analytically useful because they help the research develop a theory that accounts for variations from the dominant theme. Now, this is an example of Carolyn Anderson who worked in the healthcare industry until she lost her job nine months ago. She used to bring in about half per household's um, $150,000 a year income. Her husband Ben's reaction highlights the anomaly of women focusing on job searching. Mimicking Carolyn, uh, Ben hunches his back, staring at a spot on the table in front of him and he mimes furiously typing on a keyboard. Clearly annoyed, he stops and explains. She's on a computer morning, noon, and night. She's kind of obsessed. Obsessed is a strong word, but I don't know what, how else to say it other than if you can be strongly determined, she's like 10 blocks beyond that. Caroline agrees with Ben, describing her day, and she says, usually I'm at the computer. I contacted this person, I spoke to this person on the phone, really trying to work my network because I saw a job here or there. So I feel like I was working a full day. It was all job search related. Caroline blames herself for not immersing herself into housework, saying it's not my focus. I guess I get so enthralled in other things that I don't make spending an hour on dinner a priority. Unlike unemployed men, as you'll just see, um, Caroline feels guilty emphatically adding, and I should. Um, so she says, I don't spend an hour making dinner a priority, but I should. Um, this negative case sort of shows what happens in families when women sort of reject the domestic and strive to be ideal job seekers. Caroline's compliance with the ideal job seeker norm does not met her encouragement or the redirection of resources. Instead, it's seen as excessive and inappropriate. Um, unemployed women describe spending more time on chores, as I said, as a way of contributing to their families. But men clearly saw their contribution as linked to finding a job. And this was encouraged by their wives as well. So this book highlights the role, the key role of spouses in encouraging compliance with gender norms. Through daily uh, conversations and interactions, wives demonstrate to their unemployed husbands that they need to adhere to the ideal job seeker norm. And to do so, the husbands get sort of resources, time, space, money to do that. Not so with unemployed women, where husbands minimize uh, women's economic contribution to the family and don't encourage labor force participation as extensively. Now, I just want to see, kind of link these findings to COVID-19 a little bit, because I think they do have some implications for what we are seeing happening now. What we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic um, is that we've seen a lot of these processes around whose job matters more um, and who should be supported in re-entering the labor force playing out. For instance, lockdown and school closure measures the world over um, meant that parents in this professional middle class were working from home, whilst children were also at home and attending online school. Emerging data suggests that unpaid work grew for families, 
uh, with both parents spending more time on unpaid work, but mothers potentially doing much more. So there's, um, we're still waiting for findings to kind of come out clearly on this, but there are some indications that mothers were doing more. Often they were taking charge of homeschooling, for instance, which already adds on a lot of unpaid work. Um, one study from Australia, again, emergent study, um, I don't think these findings are peer reviewed yet, but it's uh, calculated that unpaid work increased by an enormous six hours per day. Much of this on homeschooling of which men did two additional and women did four additional. Some evidence suggests that mothers in particular have cut back on time spent on paid work, including in terms of being pushed out of the labor force in the US due to the impossibility of managing so much unpaid work as well as doing paid work. Additionally, in many countries, sectors where women and minorities of work appear to have been harder hit, leading to disproportionate job losses here. The findings I have shared today um, indicate for that for unemployed women from the professional middle class, support for re-entering the labor force after job loss may be limited, right? If it's not seen as so important, which, I mean, we don't know how it will be seen in their families, um, whether they're encouraged to kind of re-enter the labor force and in what terms, uh, we have to kind of wait and see what happens there. But it's possible that their paid work may get downplayed and seen in their families as less important than their unpaid work. And some of these trends, like I said, we've already kind of seen. So as social scientists examine how and why gender inequalities persist, we should retain an eye on marriage and family and how new norms may emerge to reinforce longstanding and gender inegalitarian logics. So with that, I'd like to thank you for having me here and I look forward to discussion now. Thank you, Alia. Thanks for that excellent talk. Um, there's just so much to think about, but I think you really successfully demonstrate how this ideal worker norm is on the decline, even among this very privileged group in the US, whereas it seems like the ideal family norm characterized by this intensive mothering is perhaps more rigid and less unchanging, less changing in that sense. So that's really interesting to think about. And for that reason, also the connections that you make between sociology of work and sociology of family become so much more significant. Um, so I have a lot of questions, but I won't exploit my Chair's privilege. Um, we have a lot of people on this Zoom call. Um, so if people would like to either post their comment question in the chat and I can pick it up from there or use the hand raise feature and I should be able to spot you and say um, your name and you can ask your question. So who would, does anybody have any immediate question? Should I keep sharing my PowerPoint or should I switch it? Um, maybe switch it off and maybe we can have a gallery of people on there so you can see more faces perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Well, maybe I can ask one then um, while people are still thinking about it. I was just wondering about the point that you made in terms of working from home as well. Um, just connecting that to the findings around being able to create space within the home to work on your employment when you're unemployed. Now, of course, there's a different situation when you're working from home, you're still in employment and doing that from the space of home. Um, but do you have a sense of what that kind of spatial transposition of work full time into home does to these patterns um, that you identify in terms of thinking through employment and unemployment as well? Yeah, I mean, I have some conjectures, but I don't have any sort of data-based answers at this point. My guess would be that if um, sort of men's paid work is seen as more important for whatever reason, it might be that it might be partly that if the man earns more, or it might not be that. It might be that he's seen as sort of, you know, being often this is rationalized by he doesn't earn more, but he's on the brink of a promotion, or this is like a turning point for him, but not for um, women or whatever, then I'm guessing they might have more access to either actually a demarcated space in the home, or um, it might be things like uh, gadgets that they have access to, like, you know, you need this special kind of um, chair or you need a special kind of a screen or whatever, that kind of stuff, people spending money there. I don't have any data-based answers on this. I've only seen, like, I've seen a lot of popular news articles, like in the New York Times and stuff, um, about you know how mothers are sort of going to the bathroom to kind of uh, get on a conference call while husbands often have access to like you know a separate space, but these are not data based answers. So this is my conjecture. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. 
Okay, so we have a few questions now. The first one is from Sophie, who asks, did you ever have male participants who actually embraced home responsibilities rather than the idea of seeker role? And did that have anything to do with age, educational background, or anything else? Yeah, I did. Um, so the dominant trend in my study was that uh, people were embracing the ideal job seeker norm, but there was a minority of men who were sort of, um, I wouldn't say they were embracing sort of stay-at-home fatherhood or embracing unpaid work, but they felt a stronger obligation that because they weren't earning, um, providing economically, they ought to provide in some way. They felt like, you know, my wife is in paid work and I can't, um, I can't, she can't also be like responsible for the unpaid work, especially now that I'm at home. The way, uh, that was a minority, it was about, I mean, I would say it was about six of the men in this. So it was a re relatively substantial minority, but these were not men who, I would say they weren't embracing, um, un they weren't em embracing stay-at-home fatherhood because they all had plans for sure of re-entering the labor force and this was something they were doing stop gap so this was it wasn't like unemployment was an event that made them reevaluate whether they belong in the labor force or not which it did do for some women in some cases um the other thing i would say was in terms of the commonality of what drove these unemployed men for instance when they were more likely to embrace um unpaid work in a way um it wasn't age and so on it was more their employment histories so these were often men who had had less stable employment histories, um, especially than their wives. So they were ones who had um, often been in and out of uh, paid work or who had kind of been doing, you know, very well paid, but consulting work, contract work, sort of without benefits, even though very, very well paid, while their wives might have had um, sort of paid work with benefits and things like that. So it was those men with sort of less stable employment histories who were more likely to do this. But again, I would say this with a lot of caution. This is a qualitative study with a small n, so um, yeah. Yeah, um, so we have a comment and question from Robert. He says, thanks for the great talk. It's really fascinating. He wonders if you have any insights perhaps while following up with your participants into the outcomes of the job searches. So for example, are there any patterns, gender or other in terms of who is likely to find work in the end or decisions about giving up on job searching? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, what I found was that with unemployed men, they were more likely to have re-entered the labor force in some way or the other. Now, the some way or the other part is really important because often it was um, saying that, sort of getting fed up of job searching and sort of saying, I have my own consulting company, right? So you have your card to kind of give out. It might be that. Um, they often ended up back in, not back, they often ended up in consulting work including, um, which they didn't often want. They Partly they didn't want that because consulting work in the US comes without, um, usually without healthcare, um, pen, you know, pension is anywhere, like an outdated concept there. It's like a 401k, which is um, more insecure, more unstable. Um, it would come without that. So that's why these people didn't want that uh, consulting work, but they would often end up in consulting jobs, including um, participants who had moved, I had at least two or three who moved far away um, because that was the only job they got. So they were maintaining two households with their wives who were employed in whatever state they'd been and they had moved away. With uh, unemployed women, uh, when I often what happened was at their original interviews, especially women with young children would talk about how they wanted a job that would give them what they called um, mommy hours, right? So they were like, you know, I have kids and I wanna be able to um, take care of my kids or not spend money on childcare for kids or whatever. So I need jobs that let me do that. What they ended up doing often, which was surprising to me, but it shouldn't have been, was they often still went back to full-time work. And partly they did that because in the U.S. in particular, part-time work is um, really not well paid. Now, this varies from labor market to labor market. In some places, in some countries, you can find part-time work that's, you know, um, well paid and comes with benefits. That's not the case in the U.S. where part-time work generally tends to be low quality work. So for women, um, when they were thinking about, you know, whether part-time work actually made sense. They were like, they often reached the conclusion that it didn't make sense, that it didn't offer enough financially or in terms of benefits. Um, and so they went back to full-time work or they continued job searching for like a very long time um, where they just like, I'm not getting the kind of job that, that uh, offsets my childcare requirements, basically. Yeah. 
Um, we also have a message from Ali who says his internet isn't too great today. Um, he is interested to hear your thoughts more about the pandemic and the gender division of labor and potentially how furlough, et cetera, fits into all of this. Okay, uh, so what I think about that, I think there's a lot of people, because I think a lot of um, resources have sort of been redirected in, you know, in the UK and the US to kind of focus on COVID-19 research. I think we've had like a lot of rapid grants and things like that coming up. So I think I am seeing, um, like I think the journal community work and family, for instance, had, I think it had or is having a special issue on sort of uh, paid and unpaid work during COVID-19. I know there's a lot of research, including in the UK and Australia and the US who've already fielded surveys and interviews looking at this question um, of how paid and unpaid work is being divided. Um, I, I don't know what the clear findings are. I'm following, I mean, I'm following this research, but at this stage, most of the manuscripts really are at a, um, available in sort of, you know, stock archives and things like that, but they're, they haven't necessarily been peer reviewed, except for community work and family, there's some stuff there. Um, so there is research coming out on this. Some of it seems to be pretty positive in that it seems that this is a crucial time when men are sort of stepping up and doing um, more unpaid work than they were previously. It's unclear to me whether that's offsetting the paid work, the unpaid work that women are doing. And I think to me, what's troubling is that if women are getting pushed out because of demands of unpaid work, that to me is very troubling. Um, in just in terms of what does it mean for, you know, you know, we know that for instance, uh, gaps in uh, your labor market participation have long-term impact of your um, earnings over your life course and things like that. So my point is basically, I, I don't think we have an answer yet as to what this division looks like. Um, and as to what, whether this, you know, very unique time period we're in will actually have long lasting impacts. If, if we're seeing positive, um, trends towards gender egalitarian divisions, whether these will remain and persist over time. I don't think we have data on that yet. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff coming up, as you say. Um, I saw there's some prelim preliminary research on how women are submitting fewer articles to journals. And the study that I saw was specifically to do with STEM, so I don't really know what the trends are in social sciences, um, but that men's output academic output during this time has gone up as women's academic output has gone down. Um, so it will be really interesting to see when these studies are eventually fully reviewed and published um, as to what they tell us um, in this regard. And a lot of, if I can just jump, a lot of these indications we won't even see for a few years, right? Like, because these publishing outputs, they would impact people's promotion or like, what you know, whatever, a few years down the line, not even now. And I can see this promotion thing also be mattering in the corporate sector or like non-academic sector about who, you know, yeah, anyway, so we have to wait and see what happens five to six years down the line, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is a question from Ashling who says, so you've obviously done research with pretty privileged um, backgrounds of people. Um, and her question is, do you think the same pattern of gender roles would emerge in families from less privileged backgrounds, um, for example, lower middle class or working class families? Um, and I guess in the context of the US? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I think, so there is research which shows that sort of material necessity, um, okay, let me put it this way. There is research that has shown that um, working class couples tend to be more gender egalitarian, partly because they can't afford to be gender egalitarian. You know what I mean? Um, but there's also research, there's also been other research on working class families, which has shown that um, there's one article that I'm thinking of uh, from, Cornwall and Ligarski and Gender and Society in like 2010, which showed uh, that sort of men's unemployment did not um, mean more equality in the division of paid and unpaid work. And partly this is due to structural factors, which was the author pointed out that um, uh, that men in that kind of study had better access to better paid jobs than women, did, that women's jobs in general tend to pay less than women's, right? Like this is when you think of structural gendered um, occupa occupational segregation, right? Um, so that the material factors aren't there in place to catalyze this equality that we might think. But I would say this is a debate. Some people have argued very strongly that working class families tend to be more gender egalitarian because they can't afford to be than privileged samples or privileged families like in my study. Um, I am not entirely 
sure of that. We also do know that working class women, again, because of the kind of jobs available to them, tend to have more spotty um, employment histories, partly because that's uh, that's how work is structured, where if you're um, if you have higher credentials and so on, if you're more affluent, you just have access to what's called good jobs in a way. So it's not immediately clear to me, I would say. I think this is a debate. Yeah. I mean, we have a couple of methodological questions. Um, I can see Marjan has a question. Um, Marjan, I can see you in video. Would you like to ask your question yourself? I'm happy to read them out, but if you'd like to ask it yourself, that might be nice. Okay. Yes. There we go. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, fascinating. Uh, I was just wondering about the methodology, uh, about the uh, ethnographic bit that you mentioned that contributed quite a few interesting uh, findings uh, when you were observing the families' interactions. So I was wondering, uh, do you think this kind of method could be possible at all under the current conditions? Uh, you know, could you think about, um, when you think about what it contributed and and how you did that research. Uh, and perhaps there are some interesting questions such as, uh, was it difficult to get to the family houses at all? You know, did you take notes after every day when you were there? It's, it's a very in intensive method, right? So, so do you think, uh, could you think of any options of doing this kind of research now? And, can, and could you just tell a little bit more about your experience of that method? Just sure. Just before you answer that, Ali, I just also wanted to add that there's a question from Jessica um, where she asks, how did you go about setting up the family observations? And did you do anything in particular to make them feel relaxed so that the interactions while it's being observed were natural and realistic? Um, so I thought I'd add it here while you're answering methodological questions. Yeah, thanks. You know, this is, uh, uh, Marcin, your question is really interesting because you asked, could we do this under the conditions right now? And the article on uh, where we lay out how to do intensive family observations came out like in March or April, right after COVID-19. I was like, this is like the worst timing ever <laughs> because I think this is very impossible to do right now. I don't think with these uh, measures, you can do it. Like the closest I can think to um, think of it is like, you know, which, which is not the same is um, giving people like video cameras to place somewhere in their room, which by the way, people have tried earlier. Like I remember there was um, maybe in 2012 or something, there was a study in California that was gonna do this with 150 families, like give them videos um, to do um, observational stuff. It didn't go anywhere. It got a lot of money, it didn't go anywhere because this is the kind of thing that people didn't feel comfortable with, I guess, um, having like videographing themselves. I don't think family observations of the kind I did are possible under the current conditions. Now a little bit about um, what it was actually like doing the family observations. Um, I don't think I did anything particular to make them feel comfortable. Um, or to get naturalistic things. What I did was basically say like, you know, um, I, I kind of reassured them that I'm not there to judge them. I'm there to kind of see what, uh, you know, I, I'd make sure that they knew that I thought unemployment was an uh, important issue that needed to be studied and could I see what how it had been for them. Um, but I also said that if you don't want me for any part of it, um, if you don't want me to come on a specific day, if you don't want me to kind of write something down, then feel free to tell me. I was like, this should be, you should feel like you're in control of what you're sharing with me, which I think is important generally in qualitative research, whether it's observational or interview. Um, now, I mean, with a study like this, where you're in this kind of private space of the home, I mean, I think some of the questions are getting at how much of this private space of the home do I actually capture? And my answer to this would be whatever the family wants allows me to capture really like you know this is it's still like i'm in the private space of the home but it's not like i have access to their backstage as goffman would stay, say they still like you know when i did exit interviews with the families they would talk about how they had been often on their best behavior how they had often you know um been very like sort of been playing host to me they would kind of say that um but at the same time i think i got a lot of insight like i was there um when families fought for instance and I had to think about like when a couple is fighting over how to discipline a child, um, how do I sort of, you know, kind of retreat into the background? Um, that was something, and I write about it in the article, like, you know, what my sort of decision was at that point. And a lot of it is just kind of basic humanity, right? Like you don't wanna, um, you don't wanna be there in people's faces when they're having a pretty disturbing argument um, and so on. Um, so that was my approach. I would say, I'm, I think I'm capturing some depth um, 
of experience of how unemployment matters, but I would not say that I'm getting exactly what was going on at all. I don't think that in this space of the family, you can say, this is exactly how the family is. I don't think that this method lends itself to that. But I think complemented with the interviews, it provides insights that are analytically useful. Um, I can go on about this, but I, I don't want, to, I, I mean, I should. Um, I'm curious about whether your respondents have read your work at all, especially now that your book is out. Um, I don't know. Some people share their book with their respondents. I did not do that um, for no other reason than, um, I guess, I mean, I think the best practice is to share your work, right? To send them a copy of the book. That would be like the right thing to do. I didn't because I think I'm scared of what they might say. Like, I think I've represented them very fairly, but I can still imagine them being upset. Like when I'm pointing out, like, look, they did this, but this is, look, gender inequality. You know, I think they might not like that. Um, and so, so I haven't done it, but I think, I think it would be a good thing to do. And if I was less of a coward, I would do it. Pointing out gender inequality is, is tough. <laughs> um, Brendan, did you want to ask your question yourself? Okay, um, thank you. They're absolutely fascinating uh, on, on so many levels, the, the research you shared with us today. Uh, so many thanks for that. In particular, I'm interested in, you say that you had the possibility to see how things evolved over time. And presumably, like lots of unemployed people, when they were first made redundant or left a job, they thought it might be for days or weeks. And then it was slowly dawning on them that time was going on and it was becoming more of a permanent situation they're in. Did you see, did you get any sense through your research of how these gendered roles played out and changed over time? Yeah, a little bit. Um, with women in particular, what I found was like, you know, especially it was in the first few months that women, like, you know, I started off the anecdote with Darlene sort of feeling very at home, sort of being like, you know, I can be a stay-at-home mother. So with women, this was very true in the initial months. But with Darlene, she, for instance, had set herself a goal of nine months, that she could be unemployed for nine months, which she'd had another job loss a few years earlier. So she was like, I know that for my position, this is how long it takes to get an position of that time. So she was okay with that. Um, but when she still hadn't gotten a job by the time nine months came around, that's when she started getting antsy both about her job, but also about like, what am I doing? I don't want to be this, the motherhood that had appealed to her so much in the first few months. It was just, she was like, no, this is no longer fulfilling for me. There's no reason my son that I should be picking and dropping my son off. He can take the bus. Things that had been sort of very meaningful. She was like, no, she was really irritated by that, by that point. And that's what I saw in um, a lot of these sort of uh, unemployed mothers, especially when they had older kids. I didn't see it with unemployed mothers with younger kids. For them, as time went on, even though they sort of often wanted to be back in the professional realm, this just the whole kind of thing of like not having access to childcare really was a very important aspect for them in terms of um, even if they wanted the professional fulfillment, it was like they felt very sort of motherhood still retained very remained very important for them. With unemployed men, what I saw over time was a sort of, I mean, it was quite sad actually, because it was a lot of, it was a retreat from the kind of job that they thought they could get. It was a sort of dawning of this realization, the kind of, that sort of my career, it's not over, but it's not gonna be, I'm not getting that full-time job with the benefits anymore. And I have to reconcile with that, that it's gonna be these kind of contract uh, jobs, consulting jobs, and with some sort of saying, okay, I'm fine with this. At least I get to, if I really hate something, I don't have to do it or you know, I can do something else. So it was that kind of a reconciliation over time that realizing that the sort of heyday of your career may ha have passed you. Thanks, Alia. Um, we have a couple of questions about the ideal worker and ideal job seeker norm um, and then gender relations at the site of the family. One is from Jules and another from John. Jules, did you want to ask your question yourself? Yeah, I'm happy to, um, although I might cough, not all over you because I'm away from all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wondered, I really, uh, when you were talking about um, Larry and Darlene and how Larry was not quite, but almost disinterested in Darlene's job hunt in contrast to um, the wives of the unemployed men. I just wondered how much, whether you thought that was um, related to or reflective of kind of a wider less interestedness on the part of um men may like kind of men ideal workers in their wives careers and how much that might be reflected to wider 
less interest that kind of reproduces the norm of the breadwinner and kind of whose work is important as less important. Yeah. Just, sorry, earlier, just to tag on to that, the question from Jung sort of follows on from it and asks how the role of gendered ideal job seeker impacts on people's intimate relationships. Um, does this raise tensions? Um, how are these couples perceptions and reactions to the situation? Okay, so to answer this question of like, you know, to what extent does sort of Larry's disinterest or other men's disinterest and their wives reemployment reflect broader sort of interactional or communication sort of uh, ranges within families. And I would say you're right. I mean, we know from research, right, on in families, especially like heterosexual married families, that it's women who generally tend to kind of initiate conversations around sensitive issues to do, you know, like for instance, um, uh, physical or mental ill health or things like that. It's women tend to kind of bring that stuff up more and talk more about it. We also know from other research employment that men's job impacts, um, when it's especially when it's not going well, impacts wives usually much more than uh, stresses from wives' jobs impact um, husbands. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think what's interesting here about is about how um, when husbands are um, not engaging with the job search stuff, how at the same time they're also pointing out that uh, women's paid work or the income from it is not important to me. So I think I see both of that going on. Um, so I think it, it is reflective of general broader trends in how married couples communicate. But I think this downplaying, this explicit downplaying of the role of women's income is noteworthy regardless of the broader kind of communications. I think it goes beyond that um, to reinforce the male breadwinner, female kind of care uh, family structure. Um, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, just last couple of questions. So we have one from Sarah who says, I'm interested in how you think ideals have causal effects. They obviously do, and yet the ideal is constituted out of so many other factors. Can you say a bit about how you're using the sociological concept of the ideal role, especially since this is itself also socially determined as well as determining? Yeah, I don't know um, about the causal role. I think these are important. I think the ideal worker and I hope the ideal job seeker are concepts that tell us, that inform us why people are behaving the way that they do, but not that this norm necessarily exists. And so it's causing this. I think these are ways for people to rationalize um, why they're doing what they're doing. But the same thing, I mean, my point here would be that the norm is seen and acknowledged to exist by families of unemployed men and unemployed women. It's just seen as less important in this case for unemployed women. So I'm not trying to understand the thing correctly, but I would say I'm, I wouldn't say I'm making a causal argument. I think I'm kind of trying to raise a concept which I hope helps uh, kind of show how people um, understand the situation they're in and rationalize the situation they're in. Often in this case, for, for behaviors and beliefs that then end up being gender inegalitarian. Thank you. Okay, and a great final question from Eona. So she says, if even this crisis period of unemployment isn't enough to dismantle the unequal gender division of labor, but has actually ended up reinforcing it, what do you think it will take to have a radical shift in how people perceive responsibilities for housework, childcare, and employment? Yeah, I think um, I think we have like a lot of data on this issue of what can catalyze more egalitarian behaviors. I don't think the answer lies necessarily just with people's attitudes or individuals' behaviors. I think the answer. I think what the research shows is that um, social policy can really kind of help catalyze the right social policy can really help catalyze egalitarian behavior. So this would be stuff like, I think this necessitates a change in how paid work is organized, where these expectations of sort of being available, especially like, you know, I mean, I, I'll talk specifically about the professional middle class where this expectation of sort of working long hours in these jobs, working, prioritizing work above all else, paid work above all else. I think that needs to kind of really be rethought to encompass people's um, responsibilities outside of the workplace. So firstly that, um, secondly, I think social policies around um, 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 uh, that uh, acknowledge caregiving can be very important. So we have study from, I can, I'm thinking of this one, I think in American Sociological Review by David Padula and Sarah Thibault, where they show that even when people have relatively um, would prefer sort of more egalitarian um, 
ways of dividing up paid and unpaid work and the absence of social policies that support that when they when it comes to it they end up falling into kind of more gender traditional ways of dividing it up that um instead of sort of innovating to make more egalitarian scripts, they fall back on con conventional tropes. And I think enough studies have shown this over time that we can take that this is pretty solid. That in the absence of sort of policy support that encourages um, gender egalitarian practices, people will take the gender traditional approach. Thank you, Alia. Um, thanks. That was a really good discussion with all the questions from everyone who's attending today. Um, there's so much to think about, and I think specifically at this time when we're experiencing shifts in our work and family and life generally, um, just gives us a lot to think about. So thank you for spending your afternoon with us and speaking with us and engaging in this discussion. Thank you to everyone who has attended today, um, and the seminar series will continue. I think the next session is on the 1st of December, is that right, Joe? Yes, and details will be circulated in due time. Um, but yes, um, I will also do a, an applause reaction for Alia um, and say thank you to her and to everyone who participated and hope to see all of you very soon. Thanks, thanks so much for having me and uh, thanks for all your questions. Great, thanks, bye.